Welcome everyone to the 2021 New York State World Languages Professional Development Series. My name is Candace Black and I'm your World Language Associate in the Office of Bilingual Education and World Languages of the New York State Education Department. In this workshop entitled Understanding New York State World Language Themes and Topics, we will explore ways to develop rich and culturally contextualized unit themes that are built from New York State World Language Themes and Topics. You'll learn how to integrate multiple topics and authentic resources to promote interdisciplinary thinking, provide communicative context, and highlight cultural perspectives. Presenters will discuss alignment of key language functions and text types to target proficiency checkpoints while sharing approaches and processes they prefer in preparing to craft thematic units. A few housekeeping details before we get started. We have over 200 pre-registered attendees today, so we ask that you remain muted and that you reserve use of the chat for questions for the presenters or for when they ask you specifically to use this feature. If you get disconnected, just reconnect or call me and I'll assist you. My cell phone number is listed on the confirmation email I sent you yesterday and today. Bill Heller has very generously put in the link to the handouts folder for today's workshop in the chat multiple times. It will continue to be added during the workshop, but we recommend that you grab that and you be able to access those items. It'll also be included in the follow-up email that's sent to you later today or early tomorrow. Within 24 hours of the event, those of you who have attended will receive either a certificate of attendance or a certificate documenting CTLE, depending on what type of information you provided when you registered. As you know, this workshop is being recorded. The video of the uploaded will be uploaded to the World Languages Professional Learning website within about a week of this event. And those who were unable to attend this live webinar will be able to earn CTLE credit by viewing the video and answering seven out of 10 questions correctly on a post assessment. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to thank the following individuals for their help in assisting with this workshop. Aris Thompson, Barbara Patterson, Kimberly Harder, Louisa Mota, and Yunxiao Zhang. Our workshop presenters today are Bill Heller, Dr. Lori Langer de Ramirez, and Dr. Joanna O'Toole. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to invite Bill, Lori, and Joanne to begin this workshop. So thank you everyone for being here today. So I wanna bring your attention to this slide, mark your calendar. This is just one of many webinars and part of a larger professional learning series that began this past year and that will be continuing. And so you can see that we have numerous sessions lined up for the rest of the current um, academic year or semester, I'm at the college level. For those of you who are here today who are additionally registered for the workshop sessions next week on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, please know that content from today's session will be what we're working with when we come together next week. So prepare to reflect on those ideas before we meet. From talking about themes and standards today, we're going to be talking about unit planning in a very robust way. You can see a primary part one session with Bill, Laurie, and I, and then we're bringing in three outside speakers, each of whom will have a particular area of expertise, checkpoints A, B, and C, but who will also have other ideas to share that may be applicable at other checkpoints we invite you to register for each of these and you'll be able to register on the OBEWL professional learning webpage. So again, today our focus is on understanding New York State world language themes and topics. And we just have a few symbols today, the idea that your microphone is muted, we thank you for that. When you see a folder symbol on the slide that will indicate that that, slow, that um, content is in our Google folder that Bill has linked in the chat and that again Candy has indicated will come an email to you tomorrow. And then we will invite you to enter into the chat, but today because we have so much content, it will really only be at the end of the session. And again, we just really thank you for limiting what you put in the chat so that people aren't distracted by the chat and can attend to the contents of today's session. 
we have three primary goals and they are I can recognize various starting points and processes to create a rich, meaningful, and relevant context for thematic units. I can understand the four themes and 17 topics that accompany the New York State Learning Standards for World Languages as a source of context and content for thematic units. And finally, I can evaluate unit themes based on specific criteria. So here we go. And where we're going to start is by answering the question, what do the standards say about themes and topics? So there happens to be key wording in each one of the five revised New York State World Language Standards that point to the importance of context, meaning the purpose and the role of the themes and topics. So when we look at the World Language Communication Standards, we will see, whoop, back one, that our anchor standard has the words, a variety of contexts. Standard one, a variety of topics. Standard two uses the word information. And standard three re returns to the wording, a variety of topics. Our, or our culture standards, it shows up a little bit differently, but we see in, in standard four, the culture studied and standard five, the culture studied in their own. Again, the context around which our students will communicate. So what is meant by context and, and why does it even matter? Well, Glisson and Donato define context as the frame around the contents of communication. And context creates a clearly defined purpose for communication and accurate understandings and interpretations of speech acts. Context is established at the start of instructional planning. And in your instructional planning, you carry it out not only in those lessons, but throughout the assessments and all of the learning experiences. So what has been and what is the New York State guidance on world language themes and topics? Well, we have two documents here that offer us that information. 1986, our modern language for communication, and in 2021, our current themes and topics document, which we will reference to. So starting in 1996 and continuing right to the current day, we have primarily been addressing 15 discrete topics as they were listed in Modern Languages for Communication. And in many cases, they've been planned and taught as 15 discrete units of instruction and typically organized by sequencing those discrete subtopics. So we can see one screenshot from page 13 of Modern Languages for Communication, the topic of house and home. And under it, we have types of lodging and we have rooms and other lodging components. And then within those, another set of lists, the house, the apartment, rental, ownership, and so on and so forth. And so I know way back in the, the days when I was teaching this unit to my beginning language students, I went right in that order. And so that's pretty much how people proceeded. And in this document, we were offered a definition of the word topics. And that definition is the subjects of communication. And even though our guidance is changing, this definition is not changing. So topics still continue to be the subjects of communication. And they're the basis for meaningful communication in any culture. And they have always been intended to be spiraled across checkpoints. So not only do we talk about a topic at checkpoint A, but also checkpoint B and checkpoint C, 
being reintroduced, reinforced, and expanded as our students' proficiency increased. And topics were never intended to be ordered or sequential, although we may have followed the sequence that they were presented in the syllabus, nor were they intended to promote comprehensive academic knowledge. So in other words, world language educators are facilitators of communicative proficiency development and culture learning. And world language educators are not teachers of content. The content is what our students are purposefully, meaningfully communicating about. And when that content is cultural, it becomes what our students identify, describe, explain, and compare as indicated in our culture standards. So what is the new guidance? Well, the 2021 guidance on New York State World Language themes and topics adds a component that we didn't see before, the component of themes. And themes are defined as unifying ideas. We still have topics, and those topics identify the specific foci for teaching and learning within the themes. And the expectation for you as a teacher in your planning is that you're integrating these topics both within and across themes so that you can create meaningful context for communication. You can show your students those meaningful relationships among topics. You can promote retention of high frequency topics, those topics that are important in every one of those different contexts and explore interdisciplinary connections. In other words, it really creates possibilities that weren't possible with the current set of topics. So I want to let you know that our starting point was with themes that already existed in AP and IB programs, and our standards review committees took a look at those and said, which ones should we adopt? Which ones should we keep? Which ones should we revise? Which ones should we create as our own? And so let's take a look at the four themes that were chosen by our standards review committees. We have identity and social relationships, contemporary life. We have, oh, my eyesight's not quite so good, sci science, technology, and the arts, and global awareness and community engagement. The standards review committees then took a look at those 15 existing topics in modern languages for communications and said, what stays? What goes? What didn't even, what couldn't we even think about back then? And then determined the 17 topics and which ones of the themes we would dedicate them to. And so you can see how those themes are distributed and we'll see them more closely on the next slide. And then the standards review committees decided where these were going to be distributed. And so they spiraled them across three proficiency checkpoints. We see that 14 of these topics show up at all three checkpoints, 16 at checkpoint B, and all 17 at checkpoint C. For a closer look, we can see them on this next slide. For identity and social relationships, we the standards review committees determined that we would have the topics of identity, family and social relationships, celebrations, customs, and traditions. Under contemporary life, you can see a lot of very familiar topics. These are mostly the ones that we saw in modern languages for communication, some slightly reworded. Food and meal taking, house and home, school life and education, travel, leisure, communities and neighborhood, shopping, and earning a living. And you'll see that earning a living is not applied at checkpoint A. It doesn't mean you can't teach it at checkpoint A. 
it just means that if and when we do get our assessments back, we won't be assessing earning a living at checkpoint A. Science, technology, and the arts, health and wellness, a change. It used to be health and welfare. Physical environment, climate, weather, and geography. Technology, media, and social media, a topic or a set of topics we couldn't even have imagined in 1986. And the arts. And then, of course, global awareness, community engagement. We have environmental issues and sustainability, also checkpoints B and C, social justice and human rights, checkpoint C. So those of you who attended our workshop on proficiency back in July may recall that there are four primary components of proficiency descriptors, and one of those happens to be context. And so this is a quick look at what the proficiency descriptor said about context at each one of the proficiency major levels, novice, intermediate, and advanced. And our checkpoint A is at the novice level. And we can see that the context for novice level themes and topics needs to be highly predictable, everyday topics that affect students directly. While for our checkpoints B and C, which are the intermediate contexts, it's about familiar topics related to students' daily lives and straightforward survival situations. But one of our goals is always that proficiency development and reaching into that next proficiency level. So we want to also be thinking for our checkpoint C students in particular, what those advanced contexts are, autobiographical topics, as well as topics of community, national or international interest, and having them deal with social situations with an unexpected complication. And although we may be thinking about the themes and topics for a given unit of instruction, we can't not keep in mind the larger context, which is our curriculum, and our, ideally our curriculum at a given checkpoint. So we want to examine how are we distributing the themes, the four themes? How are we distributing the topics that should be integrated and spiraled and revisited across the entire checkpoint? So this image just gives you that idea that we want to make sure that we're revisiting, that we're spiraling across our topics, our themes, across our courses, and across our checkpoints. So how do our new New York State themes and topics align with some of those frequently used curricular frameworks for assessments that you already may be familiar with, as Joanne alluded to earlier? Well, the short answer is very well. Some schools in New York State may be using the six themes and 41 topics of College Board's AP Language and Cultures um, uh, themes and topics as a tool for vertical alignment across the checkpoints. Other schools might be using the five themes and 29 topics of the uh, International Baccalaureate or the IB uh, exam as a frameworks for their context. If we compare the two frameworks with the four themes and 17 topics of the New York State World Language Themes and Topics, we found that they lined up pretty well. In other words, if you use the New York State World Language Themes and Topics as your principal framework for horizontal and vertical curricular alignment, you can be confident that learners will get sufficient foundation for future success in AB and IB assessments at checkpoint C. Similarly, using the AB and IB themes and topics as a basis for vertically aligned curriculum uh, should also prepare students for any checkpoint A and B assessments based on the New York State topics and themes. We can also compare the New York State World Language themes and topics to several commercially available proficiency assessments. These two particular assessments are uh, report their outcomes in terms of actual proficiency levels. One such test is the APPLE or the Actful Assessment of Performance Toward Proficiency in Languages, administered by the Language Testing International. The APPLE identifies 20 distinct topics. 
Another widely used commercial test is the Standards-Based Measurement of Proficiency, or the STAMP test, created by the University of Oregon and administered by Avant Assessment. The STAMP test uses, identifies 31 topics spiraled across three major proficiency levels. And again, as with AB and IB, or AP and IB, when compared side by side, Curricular, de curricular designed around the four themes and 17 topics of the New York State World Language Themes and Topics will provide a solid foundation for success on the Apple and STAMP assessments if your school chooses to administer those. The complete comparison document is found in the handouts for the uh, handouts folder for this presentation. So you're probably wondering so where do I even start? And so we're going to share with you some potential starting places. Please know this is not a fully inclusive list of all starting places, but we do want you to know that there's not one right starting place. So let's take a look at some of these. The first one that I propose is proficiency. Remember, we just looked at what the contexts are identified in the proficiency guidelines for the different proficiency checkpoints. And so, for example, I might be considering a checkpoint A unit, um, which again, novice learners, and I remember, oh, the context needs to be something highly predictable, an everyday topic that affects students directly. So I might determine that my unit is going to be about going to school. And so then this going to school unit, I'll start looking for, well, what are those authentic resources that might be applicable, meaningful when going to school? And so maybe I'm gonna start with, oh, the things that we need when we're getting ready to go to school, school supplies, school clothing, and so on. So proficiency as one starting place. Another starting place might be the context itself. I've always been interested in teaching a unit about indigenous foods of Latin America. So I came up with this idea, oh, Sabores de la America Latina. And this would be a checkpoint C. And so with that context in mind, I'm gonna go start searching for my resources and I find a range of them so that I see, well, there's things that are historical. There are things that are literary. There are all sorts of everyday practices that are maybe traditional that are still in place today. There are celebrations. Oh, look, there's things to do with health, all sorts of possibility. And once I start finding these resources, I can really start framing out this set of themes and topics and where I'm going to go next with my unit planning. The authentic resource itself when I traveled to Costa Rica and I got my first colones, um, the monetary unit of Costa Rica. And I noticed on each of these bills was one of the biomes. It really became clear to me that this is a country that has great value for conservation. And I thought, wow, I wanna use these in some way and I wanna develop that unit around that theme. And so with Checkpoint B students, I come up with the idea of protecting our world. Bill, could you click? Thank you. Um, another possibility, another starting place, is that inquiry question. What makes something valuable to someone? And again, this is a Checkpoint C um, leading context where I identify a series of short stories where the main character has something of great value to them, value to them personally, and then valuable, perhaps in some cases, to the larger society and to others. And so I show you a few examples of texts that I identified that contain those kinds of stories. Project-based learning, you might be in a program that uses project-based learning, a STEAM program, STEM program, program where that's how you design your curriculum. And so maybe that's a starting place, 
perhaps fair trade awareness and advocacy, a checkpoint B or C certainly would fit very well with the world language curriculum. And then start looking again for those authentic resources that can connect students to those ideas. And more. Again, these are just some select starting places. There are many, many others. So just as there's not one right starting place, there's also not one right process. So I'm going to show you some processes. I do want to indicate to you that I've simplified them. And I totally recognize that these processes are more complex. And what's very typical is that we start with one process and then move into another. So let's take a look. The planning web, that semantic organizer, the, the, the mind map. So considering that going to school unit, so that might be my unit title. And I have the anchor theme of contemporary life and the anchor topic of school life and education. And so how do I start my planning? By creating a planning web. And I think about, okay, maybe I think about, again, this is that highly familiar context. What's familiar to the students? Well, getting ready for school. So maybe the first focus of the unit is what's needed for school. And then going to school, they all go to school. So how do we get to school? And then once they're in school, what takes place in school? So this might be the starting point for my planning process with a planning web. Clearly, it's not an endpoint. There's a lot more to go from here. Another design is one from um, Donna Clemente and Laura, Laura Terrell that they write about in their book, The Keys to Planning for Learning. And they talk about it being a three-part process of knowing myself, so in other words, focusing on the learner, to exploring communities, moving beyond the learner, to engaging with the world. And so a hero's unit, that's my unit title, which I've chosen to design with the anchor theme of identity and social relationships and the anchor topic of family and social relationships, you can see in the smallest circle that I'm thinking I'm going to begin my topic with personal role models. That's certainly um, an example of knowing myself, who are my role models and why. And then exploring communities, looking out to see who are those everyday heroes in my community and beyond my community. And then engaging with the world, looking at those cultural icons that exist within this context and within global contexts. Another potential design is that sequential design, especially if you're dealing with um, a text that has chapters or a series of short stories that all build on one another, this might be the first part of your process. So we can see the example with the unit title of Juan Bobo and Juan Bobo being a folk character from Puerto Rico. My anchor topic, again, I'm using identity and social relationships and the anchor topic of identity. And I'm going to start sequentially by teaching my students some cultural context that they need in order to interpret stories of Juan Bobo, all folk tales. And then I sequence three primary folk tales. Now, that's not where it ends. We go out and we learn more, but it's still showing that we are moving in a sequential direction when we start our planning process. And again, this is about not only these sequences, but the combination of them and other possible sequences. So you may be thinking, oh, this is all fine and dandy, but I have to use a textbook. So what do you do if you have to use a textbook? Well, the first thing you do is you go to your textbook chapter, which these days textbook chapters have themes and topics associated with them and you inventory 
the textbook chapter contents. What's there? Then you select the contents from that chapter that contribute to that purposeful and contextualized thematic unit. Determine your anchor theme from those four of the New York State world language themes and topics, and then select which of the topics you're going to integrate. And we haven't really talked about integrated topics yet, but you're going to see many examples as we move forward in today's webinar. And those integrated themes and topics may or may not be identical to the ones presented in the textbook. And once you've figured out what you have and what the theme and topics are going to be, then you want to enhance those by going out and finding the authentic resources and designing standards-based learning tasks that will really support the unit theme you determined. I love that Joanne is talking about different sources of inspiration, different processes, just to highlight that there are so many different ways to work with themes and topics and to, to begin this work. Um, and, and likely all of these different processes and all of these different ways of designing uh, curricula for your students will be at play at one point or another. As I design curriculum for my students, um, I like to look at this, um, this document, which comes from Helena Curtin's um, fantastic book, Languages and Learners, Making the Match. Um, it's a mindset for curriculum design. So these are themes that I like to keep in the back of my mind when I'm looking for materials, when I'm looking for inspiration, when I'm looking for fodder for creating these curricular units for our students. So she suggests that you would look for themes and topics that are culturally focused so that, of course, they lead with a cultural theme. They are communicatively purposeful, so they build towards proficiency for students. They are intrinsically interesting. In other words, relevant to the learners that you have in front of you. They are cognitively engaging, so they have a thematic focus. And they're standards-based reflecting goals for learning languages. So I love to start from a place of inspiration. Um, oftentimes I will see something, as Joanne mentioned, she saw those colonies and they inspired her to design an entire unit. And we likely have had similar experiences, um, either traveling or in our, in our travels at home as well, um, picking up items, looking at text, seeing things that, that just look fantastic for a thematic unit. In the case that I'd like to share with you today, my inspiration came in the source of a fish tank on our fourth floor. In the fish tank on our fourth floor in our school, we had a, a tank full of this wonderful little critter called the ajolote in Spanish or the axolotl. I was really intrigued um, and, and a little bit grossed out, but mostly intrigued because they're very strange looking animals. So I went over to have a look and some students were looking at them as well. And I saw a label that the science department had put on the tank that said that this was the ajolote or the axolotl, also known as the Mexican salamander. So of course my antenna went up and I said, this is something that I can work with. I want to know more. So Bill, next, next slide. So here is one of our actual ajolotes. Um, this one I believe is named Fancy Free. The kids did name our axolotls. We had five of them at one point. Um, and so I thought this was something I needed to explore and find out more about. In that exploration, I found this organization, which is an actual organization in Mexico. And I thought this was a great connection to this, this checkpoint A, so these are middle school students to the anchor theme of science, technology, and the arts, with the anchor topic being physical environment, climate, weather, and geography, and also a nod you'll see to environmental issues. So this organization um, based in Mexico um, is really focused around water issues throughout the country and also the preservation of these animals. So the context for a thematic unit about the ajolote will be based around this organization 
and they need promotional materials so that they can really help people understand the importance of water conservation and the issue around pollution in Lake Xochimilco, which is really the homeland for the axolotl. So this is the context that students will have, will hear about, and they really need the help. So we're going to enlist the help of students. So using the frame, uh, the curtain frame um, about uh, really, really strong thematic units, we'll start with culturally focused, leading with culture. So the axolotl is from Lake Xochimilco. There is a, um, a real impact of tourism um, on Lake Xochimilco. So it's a highly polluted lake. And as a result, this animal is, is quite endangered. So there is that cultural connection to Lake Xochimilco, to the, um, the, the, the idea of tourism in this area of Mexico as well. There's also a tremendous amount of really fascinating folklore around uh, Aztec or Mexica folklore and mythology around the god Xolotl. So this god is the, the basis for this animal, and it's really the origin story of this particular animal in Mexico. We can talk about las chinampas. These are canals um, and really connect to ancient farming methods um, and the use of the axolotl. And then quite wonderfully, uh, very recently, there was a competition in Mexico City to design emojis to represent Mexico City. And guess which design won? the axolotl one. Um, and so this is a, uh, a citizen of Mexico City who designed these wonderful images and they are new emojis for use in and around Mexico City, which I think are fantastic. So lots of cultural connections. The axolotl is also really lends itself, our unit around the axolotl lends itself to being communicatively purposeful, right? There's context and there's cause. My middle school students love to fight for a cause. And so they want to help these creatures. They want to fight for them and they want to educate their classmates as to, and, and, their, and the adults in the building as to why they are important. The communication in, this, in this, these tasks, in this unit, are to a, an authentic audience, not just to the teachers. So often we ask students to create things and turn it into us and then we give it back to them. But this really provides an authentic audience. They are teaching their classmates, they're teaching the school by creating posters that will help support the animals. The one you see on the left is a poster that my students did with spray paint and with um, beautiful images and I thought they were fantastic. And then of course, authentic materials provide information and cultural connections as well. There are lots of infographics about the ajolote, right? And so you see two examples here. You will notice that this is a checkpoint A thematic unit that I'm creating. And yet this particular image, this particular uh, infographic, both of them really are quite challenging in terms of proficiency for checkpoint A or novice students. So we'll edit the task not the text. I might have students really zoom into this particular infographic on the right and look for cognates and, and really connect the imagery and, and take small bits. The headings are doable. Um, they might look at the coloración, so the coloring of the, of the axolotls. They might look at the regenerative properties, which is a cognate for them. So we're really looking at pieces of the infographic and helping that, um, using that to help support their understanding. And then let's face it, these guys are really interesting. They're interesting and they're relevant to learners. Um, axolotls are, as I said, weird and cute at the same time, which is kind of gold for middle school kids. Um, they're particularly appealing to that age. They exhibit neoteny, which is the retention of juvenile features in the adult. So they're sort of the Peter Pan of uh, the animal world. They also regenerate missing limbs, which is infinitely fascinating to kids and adults alike. They come in different colors. And best of all, they are in Minecraft and Pokemon. So if you want to get your kids' attention, here is an image of Minecraft. They were just recently released into the game. Uh, and then on the lower left, you'll see the Pokemon um, similar to a, an axolotl. So there's lots of connections for kids, lots of relevance to their lives. This particular animal and the unit that you create around its theme 
uh, is cognitively engaging, right? So there's a theme that you can pull out in, in all different um, interdisciplinary ways. Obvious connections to the sciences. After all, I did discover him on the science floor of our building. So there's connections to the environment. There's a lot of genetic research being done on these animals and also medical research. There's history, so agriculture in ancient Mexico and the conquest. Connections to visual arts. People love to illustrate the axolotls, so you'll find tons of material online and great images to suit all sorts of needs and tasks. There's also a beautiful story written by Julio Cortazar about the axolotl. Again, not a novice level reading, but an excerpt is doable. So you can take a small piece of that particular story and then spiral back to it later in, in uh, higher proficiencies. By the time they reach checkpoint C, they would be able to read the entire story. And then culinary arts, like it or not, the axolotl was food in the ancient world and is food in parts of our modern world as well. So that could be a topic to, to bring in. Now, these are themes that are interdisciplinary, but you can see here they connect really, really well to our New York State themes and topics. So there are global awareness and community engagement connections, contemporary life around earning a living, like farming in the Chinampas really makes a good connection there. There are connections to the arts, to identity, especially in the Julio Cortazar story, and in food and meal taking, as I said earlier. Here we have an image, again, you can connect this to the Chinampas and to farming, so good uh, earning a living. Thank you, Bill. You're going to see a very quick video of the regenerative properties. This video is fantastic for a movie talk. You can have kids describing what they see. And above you see uh, the image from the Cortazar story. So lots of interdisciplinary connections that are just fantastic. And then last but very much not least, standards-based opportunities. So you can connect to interpretive reading, listening, and viewing, interpersonal speaking, presentational writing and speaking, and of course, the important cultural products, practices, and perspectives. In particular, um, this IPA, very, very um, interesting and compelling for kids. Uh, they can have an interpretive reading. They're going to read a wonderful book, which uh, is trilingual um, in both, it's in English, Spanish, and Nahuatl, which is fantastic. So they're going to read that text and fill in an SQA chart, right? A, or a um, KWL chart in English, things they know about the axolotl, things they want to know about the axolotl, and they'll fill in that last column, things they learned after having uh, done some research. They can then connect to classmates about the different, about their particular charts and recategorize the charts, talking about facts, problems, and how to help. So now we're moving from interpretive uh, reading to interpersonal speaking, and we're going to start taking action. In their presentational speaking and writing task, they're going to create a poster to promote the importance of saving, of knowing about this animal and of protecting our environment so we can save him. So that's my way of gleaning from inspiration in and around my school and bringing it into um, a connection to the themes and topics of the New York State Standards. So another point of departure for developing unit themes can be found in the language functions embedded in the New York State World Language Standards. Since the language functions are common to all languages, they can be an ideal starting point for programs that see a benefit of developing common themes across all languages taught at a given level. Using the common language of functions, they can allow teachers to, of different languages at the same level to collaborate in developing common instructional tasks and assessment frameworks. So I offer here an example for Checkpoint B, French and Spanish unit that became called Problems, Problems, and you could put it in the tar either of the target languages. It could easily work with other languages as well. So my first step was one of the language functions that I uh, oftentimes like to visit across checkpoint B is asking for and giving advice. And then I also want to reintroduce and extend some ways of agreeing and disagreeing in terms of how to evaluate good advice from bad advice. 
And so my next step was to brainstorm potential contexts. In other words, where do we ask for and give advice in the real world? We can talk about advice about school and study habits. We can talk about advice for relating to good health and nutrition. We can talk about self-care and social emotional health. We could talk about successful living and happiness and what are some advices, advice from, for happy living. We can talk about personal security and identity theft. We talk about travel advice. We can talk about shopping or financial advice. All of these are real world potential contexts that we could explore the language function of asking for and giving advice. So then my third step then is to take the topics list. I looked at the 14 or the 17 topics and I said, okay, what topics relate to these contexts and identified the topics, identity, travel, shopping, earning a living, family and social relationships, school, life and education, health and wellness, meal taking and food, technology and social media. All of these topics could relate, but I wanted to then narrow it down and really find a focus. So I went through my list and started to cross out things and consolidate and hone my focus on advice relating to physical and mental well-being. So I crossed out those topics and context for now. However, I also noted them for later in the course because I could reintroduce the function of asking for and giving advice in subsequent unit, thematic units I might do that might be have travel as an anchor topic or shopping as an anchor topic. So these, the key is to keep reintroducing these language functions, but this, this particular unit really focuses in on that language function and gives uh, a lot of repetition, a lot of start using the same function. So I consolidated my brainstorming into a statement of context that reads teens everywhere face challenges relating to undertake understanding their identity relationships and taking agency for their own well-being where do i where do they seek advice how do they evaluate the advice they receive do these challenges differ within or among cultures and what are constructive ways to solve the problems in doing so i've identified an anchor theme of identity and social relationships an anchor topic of family and social relationships with related topics, including identity, school life and education, health and wellness, and meal taking and food, with the focus functions being asking for giving advice and agreeing and disagreeing. So my theme has come into focus. What do I do next? The next thing I do is search for authentic resources. These will give me, these will help me narrow down very specific ways to explore the theme that'll be engaging and relevant to students. So then I start to think about the different tasks that might be related to these documents I might find. And I start with interpretive communication. At Checkpoint B, if I look at the performance indicators for Checkpoint B, I'm going to be identifying main idea and supporting details from different authentic resources about steps to problem solving and offering advice. And I'll be also evaluating good advice and bad advice. So I look and I start finding a, a wealth of different materials I can use. This is from a Facebook group from uh, this pharmacy and it gives advice for healthy living uh, using infinitive forms. This one has on the left, it has advice for um, uh, success in school that are written as familiar commands. On the right, we have steps for problem solving. So once you get a problem, we can explore how do you solve it? What do you do? What steps do you go through? Uh, here's a French brochure that gives advice on move, movement as being good for health. Now, like Lori was talking about with the, the infographic she used, this might be, it's a two-page brochure that might be a little daunting at the checkpoint B level, but you'll notice how it's broken up into chunks so that you can direct the students to focus in on different um, chunks of different parts of it to gl glean the meaning and it's really well subtitled and well laid out. Here's another one from uh, Anjou en Actu, uh, a magazine directed toward um, French youth that talks about slow movement, slow mo the slow movement and um, slowing down life and it talks about different advice and you could really get um, some good discussion and debate going about whether this is a, a good idea or not, or whether they could do it or whether they would find it helpful or more stressful to go slower. 
And then there's some memes uh, that you can find online uh, or different graphics that talk about uh, advice for healthy living and so forth. So th from then I now I have these rich documents I'm looking at, we can do the interpretive tasks, then I can think of some interpersonal communication, some common tasks for that standard, and we could invent these role plays of conversations asking for and giving advice to a friend about different stressful topics or different topics related to well being. Um, we can work in groups of three to rank order solutions. Given a bunch of solutions, we can rank order and see, decide which one we think is the, the best solution of a problem and so forth. And then presentational tasks that commonly might include creating short videos for a YouTube channel called Querida Carlota, Querido Carlos, or Cher Charles, Cher Charlotte, uh, responding to emails from fe uh, followers seeking advice, like the old advice columns. Or small groups can poll classmates about sources of stress, self-care strategies, health habits, and then they can create graphs and report results to the class. So this, com oh, this completes the, the brainstorming part of my unit design. Once I have this trove of ideas assembled, I feel confident to go on and develop my can-do statements and assessments to complete the unit planning process. So how does this plan measure up by Helena Curtin's standards for thematic units? Is it culturally focused? I would argue yes. In incorporating the authentic voices of different Hispanic and Francophone cultures, we're providing a cultural context. This is one of those times when we can point out the commonalities that our US learners have with their age peers in our target language cultures. Making comparisons also includes finding similarities as well as finding differences. Communicatively purposeful. We start with the communicative language function of giving advice and apply it to the lives of the learners. Check. Intrinsically interesting. Who doesn't like to complain about their problems, right? The documents provide some really interesting solutions to discuss and debate, so check. Cognitively engaging. The documents are within the capacity of intermediate proficiency, but put, should push most Checkpoint B learners with their content and the embedded structures used for giving advice. So I would say check on that. And standards-based, we've been able to cr create tasks to elicit interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational communication. So check. So for a Checkpoint C example, I'm going to return to an example that I teased you with earlier and using context as the starting place. So in this example, I'm going to show you how I spiraled a familiar topic, but with an eye towards advanced proficiency development. And that topic is food. And want to talk about intrinsically interesting? Everybody loves food. Culturally focused? I already decided that this was going to be not just food, but the food that, foods that are indigenous to Latin America. So that brings the culture to bear. And communicatively purposeful, cognitively engaging and standards-based, when I have my students carry out all three of the standards and the language functions associated with each, each scaffolding with an eye towards proficiency, I'm able to go check, check, check. So I need to consider, after I've determined what that context is going to be, that notion of proficiency development. These are Checkpoint C students, so they're at that intermediate level. And this graphic will be familiar to those of you who attended July's um, proficiency webinar, where language functions appropriate to the intermediate level are expressing personal meaning asking and answering questions, but at the advanced level to narrate and describe. So how do I have my students do the comfort at the intermediate level and stretching to advanced? Context we've already looked at from familiar topics related to daily life. And how do I now move that into the advanced topics or contexts of autobiographical topics and topics of community, national and international interest and text type where I'm moving the students 
from that sentence or strings of sentence level to performing at the paragraph level. So with that in mind, I begin brainstorming my thematic focuses. You can see I use the planning web and determine, well, we can look at what are those indigenous foods of Latin America or what are the crops and what are the what's the mythology, the legends, the historical understandings of those and what the historical use of these various crops and foods because they weren't all always used just for food. And moving on to another focus of the importance of indigenous foods in everyday life, in art and literature, in celebrations and traditions, and the value. And the word value here can also refer to power and monetary value. So the notion of these crops moving from Latin America to the rest of the world as being a source of wealth for the colonizers and from a source of oppression to fair trade. And my next step was to stop and inventory my existing resources. Well, I already had a book of odes by Pablo Neruda and odes, of course, being ways to celebrate the ordinary. And he happened to write odes to several of the indigenous foods. And I had several scholastic books, Sabores de América, Leyendas Americanas, or books that were specific to each one of these various indigenous foods that were bilingual. So that's what I had to start with. And my next step, step five, was to go out and see what else was out there. And I've already shown you a number of these, and some I knew to go looking for, and some I guessed. I got the idea that, you know what, if these foods are so important, what are the chances that there are celebrations around them? Well, lo and behold, May 30th is National Potato Day in Peru. And I found all sorts of incredible celebrations and practices related to health, uh, just a real wealth that reinforced which of those subtopics I was going to keep and which ones maybe I wasn't going to keep. And so I finalized from here that anchor theme, anchor topic, integrated topics, inquiry questions, and key language functions. So I already had my top, my unit title, Sabores de la America Latina. And then I settled on my anchor theme, contemporary life, anchor topic of food and meal taking. I was able to integrate celebrations, customs, and traditions health and wellness, the arts, social justice, and human rights. And my inquiry questions became, what role does food play in people's lives? How does food impact people's lives? And of course, my key language functions, remembering that interpretively, we have three language functions, understand, interpret, and analyze. And certainly understand is at the heart and soul of interpret and analyze, but interpret and analyze are pushing us to that next proficiency level. Exchanging information, expressing opinions, describing and persuading. And then with those ideas in mind, I developed my unit can do statements. Again, pushing proficiency development. Interpretively, I can infer the importance of indigenous foods in ancient Latin American civilizations from legends about indigenous foods. I can analyze authentic resources on modern day practices related to indigenous foods for their underlying cultural perspectives. Interpersonally, I can ask and answer questions about indigenous foods of Latin America, and I can exchange opinions about commercial practices over time related to indigenous foods of Latin America. And presentationally, I can describe indigenous foods of Latin America and their importance to individuals, cultures, and the world. And finally, I can persuade others with evidence of the importance of free trade principles 
and practices. So I hope those three examples and all of our explanations have helped you achieve these three goals of I can recognize various starting points and processes to create a rich, meaningful, and relevant context for thematic units. I can understand the four themes and 17 topics that accompany the New York State Learning Standards for World Languages as a source of context and content for thematic units. And finally, I can evaluate unit themes based on specific criteria. So it is at this point, and I know we're right up against the hour, that we invite you to put your questions into the chat. And we will rotate bringing those questions to bear and responding to them. If you're only here for the hour, you're welcome to log off. But if you'd like to stay on for the question and answer session, you're welcome to stay logged on. 